path to becoming a diversity consultant working in the C-suites of corporations across this country was an unorthodox one, not one that was bound in academics, but in the hard reality of growing up a black man in this country. I was born in 1950 on the south side of Chicago, born in the same neighborhood as a young man by the name of Emmett Till. When I was five years old, Emmett Till was brutally murdered in Mississippi. I didn't know it at the time or understand what was going on, but my dad, who grew up in that same neighborhood, my mother, who also grew up in that same neighborhood and was born in Mississippi or worked in Mississippi, went to school in Mississippi, knew the impact that it had on the black community. Some say it was the beginning of the civil rights movement. My dad wrote a poem in response that ringed throughout the black community in Chicago. By the time I was seven years old, <clears throat> we moved from Chicago to Seattle, where I had landed in a melting pot neighborhood <clears throat> that had a little bit of everyone in it, people that were of all colors, races, and ethnicities. And I grew up across the street from a park playing with all of those kids. I had no idea that that would be laying the foundation for me later to become a member of the Black Panther Party and a diversity consultant. And so I grew up in an era of assassinations, an era in which I witnessed the aftermath of the bombing of the 16th Street Baptist Church when the four little girls were brutally murdered. Bloody Sunday, murder of Medgar Evers, the murder of the three civil rights workers that went down, Cheney and the rest of them went down to Mississippi as freedom riders. The assassination of John Kennedy, who many black people thought was a, a shining light for our cause. And so death was not new to me. Detroit, Watts, the murder of Malcolm X. It was in the spring of 1967, as a 17-year-old, that a man by the name of Stokely Carmichael traveled to our city and told us that the reason why black people didn't have freedom is because you don't love yourself, you hate yourself, you hate the fact that you're black. That was, if I could say, my awoke moment, my political consciousness. It was at the height of the black power movement. And so <clears throat> I got involved, and the following spring in 68, I found myself handcuffed, being led from school, taken to juvie, and being locked up for uh, unlawful assembly where we had taken over a principal's office demanding a BSU for a fellow high school. And when I got in there, I noticed that all the kids were surrounding the, the TV. And I went over to see what the commotion was, and MLK had just been assassinated. I later found out that I was not the only one arrested that day. My brother, a couple of leaders from the UW, he was already at the University of Washington organizing a BSU there. A couple of my colleagues from high school were also in that juvie with me. And it was like they had gotten us off the street to prevent us from organizing doing a rallying call for the death of the Prince of Peace. You see, I had marched with King when I was 11, 12 years old. And I recalled when King said, turn the other cheek when someone slaps one cheek. But growing up in that neighborhood, growing up across the street from that park, if I had ever turned the other cheek, I would have been bullied for the rest of my high school or the rest of my grade school days. And along came Malcolm X, who said, if someone slaps you, you better slap him back. That's not violence. That's called self-defense. It's called defending your dignity, defending your honor. And so I picked up that, that call and became, that became part of who I was. A week after getting out of juvie, we traveled to Oakland, California. It was the spring of 1968. I don't know if you've ever been to the Bay Area. But the Bay Area in those years was the hotbed of 
revolution, the liberation. And we were attending the West Coast Conference of Black Student Unions. And that night, unbeknownst to us, the keynote speaker was none other than Chairman Bobby Seale of the Black Panther Party. And Bobby Seale was very angry as he was speaking. I usually don't say that because, you know, the term angry black militants doesn't sit well with me. We weren't motivated by anger. We were motivated by our love for our community. But he was angry because two days after MLK was assassinated, the first member of the Black Panther Party was brutally shot and murdered in the streets of Oakland while in police custody, shot 20 times by police bullets. And he talked about revolution. He talked about fighting until our blood runs into the streets and holding those accountable that were charged with protecting and and serving us, holding them accountable. And after he finished, you could see the line drawn in the sand of those that were scared to death and those of us that were ready to fight and die. And we made a beeline, my brother and I and a few others of us from Seattle, to Chairman Bobby, and we said, we want to start a chapter of the Black Panther Party. We had no idea what that meant. And so he told us to come the next day to little Bobby's funeral to get a taste of what we were getting into. And when we crossed the Bay Bridge down into West Oakland, I'll never forget the scene that I saw. Hundreds of young black men and women in leather jackets and berets in military formation. And I remember thinking, my God, this looks like a black army. I'd never seen anything like it. Standing at attention, we passed the rally. Bobby was there speaking. He was flanked by two bodyguards. And this white dude that I recognized, his name was Marlon Brando, a staunch supporter of freedom fighters and liberation. When I got into the church, the walls were lined with leather jacketed and men and women who in fact were there as the honor guard for, for little Bobby. And down in front was his coffin draped in a panther flag. And when it came time to view the remains, I walked by the coffin and I looked in and there was little Bobby in his leather jacket with his free Huey button, his beret, his powder blue shirt, the uniform of the Black Panther Party. And I looked in there and I realized he was 17 years old and I was 17 years old. I'll never forget that scene. It was that moment that I dedicated my life and said, I'm ready to die for the people. Two weeks later, Bobby came to Seattle and we organized the first chapter of the Black Panther Party outside of the state of California and the second chapter overall. And Bobby said, you have to prepare yourself. Two things you need to do. You need to prepare your mind. You need to be able to speak revolution and know what it's about. And he said you had to read two books every week and attend PE classes twice a week, political education. Then he said you also have to be prepared because they're coming after you. You need a thousand rounds of ammunition and two weapons. We were shocked into reality right then and there. I had two bodyguards at 17 years old. That summer of 68, J. Edgar Hoover named us the number one threat to the internal security of the United States. Why? Because we dared to stand up and fight. The Mexican revolutionary, Emilio Zapata said, I would rather die standing, fighting, than live on my knees. This became the mantra of the Black Panther Party. Huey P. Newton, the founder of the party, along with Bobby Seale, taught us the power is the ability to define phenomena and make it act in a desired manner. And so we needed to define what was going on in our community. And we had a 10-point platform and program. And point number one said we want freedom. We want the power to determine the destiny of our black community. Point number seven said that we want an immediate end to the murder of black people in our community. And see, we were not armchair revolutionaries or theorists. We were revolutionary practitioners. So we armed ourselves with shotguns and law books, and we went out and patrolled the cops and made sure that they weren't murdering innocent black people. If you can imagine that scene, armed black men and women saying, you're not going to kill this person tonight. We went on to organize in our community. We launched free breakfast programs to feed kids, thousands of them across our in our city and thousands across the country. We embarrassed the federal government into realizing you have to feed kids before they go to school. We launched free medical clinics. We started a free medical clinic in Seattle, which is still running today, because we analyzed the conditions within our community and found that young black women were dying because they could not get prenatal care. 
And so we served the people. We organized revolution. And we stood our ground. There was a well-known poet who was, spoke some of the first spoken word and who was the predecessor to rap. His name was Gil Scott Heron. And Gil Scott Heron said back then, the revolution will not be televised. Well, time passed. And today, the revolution is televised. See, we didn't have cell phones. We couldn't capture what was going on with the, with the cops trying to kill someone. We had to stop them in their tracks. But today, young people have rallied with their cell phones. They said, we don't need to pick up arms. We can pick up a cell phone. And if you try to murder this person, we're going to capture you. That's what happened to the police officers that murdered George Floyd. And now he's in prison. So you can find a different way to organize. So I traded in my guns, my law books, for a different path. See, I was tired of being chased by the police. The FBI put, on, put out a hit contract on my brother, and I faced several assassination attempts. But it was a new day. And so I became a diversity consultant. I educated myself in the field of multiculturalism, inclusion, equity. And now I'm welcomed into the boardrooms, the C-suites, and I talk to leaders about taking a stand and creating an organization that is more inclusive and equitable, one that embraces all people. See, that's one of the things that we did in the Black Panther Party. We started the initial Rainbow Coalition. We were not separatist nor racist. When we said all power to the people, we meant that all people across all race and ethnicities should have power to control the destiny within their own communities. And so we organized with groups like the Peace and Freedom Party, the Patriot Party, uh, the, 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 the Young Lords, the Brown Berets, and other organizations. Young people today call it allyship. How do you build allies? And so when I'm talking to leaders, I tell them the same thing. You got to learn the fundamentals of building that inclusive workplace. And I give them five characteristics. Number one is self-knowledge. You got to learn who you are, your styles, your behaviors, and the impact they have on others. And how when you're always trying to force somebody to come to that center, that's not the only way that you do business. Empathy. Being able to see the world from another perspective rather than your own all the time. That doesn't mean that I know what someone's life is like, but I'm beginning to try to see what it might feel and look like. Flexibility. And that's called generating multiple interpretations of others' behavior rather than a negative one. There's got to be a positive one as well. Curiosity. Wanting to learn about others. Not run away and hide and say it's too weird for me. You had a speaker earlier this evening that talked about trans people, non-binary. And people are saying, whoa, wait a minute. How are you going to understand people if you walk away? you got to use curiosity. And the last one is tolerance for ambiguity. It's not always going to be comfortable. It's not an easy path. It's not an easy journey. You're going to be uncomfortable. But if you can figure out who you are, use empathy. Be flexible and suspend judgment. Use curiosity. That'll ease your discomfort. That'll allow you to stand tall. That will allow you to be courageous. You see, leaders today, not only in our communities, young people like you out in the audience, but leaders in corporations, they need to step aside and let people lead. People don't know that 65% of members of the Black Panther Party were women. You have to step aside. It's not behind every woman is a strong man. Step aside and the woman's already there. You got to let them lead. Allow them to lead and stand, stand forward. And so you have to make a stand. You have to ask yourself, are you part of the problem or are you part of the solution? Are you going to stand and stand up for something or you stand for nothing? Are you going to stand for liberation and freedom? 
Or are you going to just let the status quo be as it is? See, there's no halfway point. There's no halfway point. You can't be governed by fear. You have to step forward. It's about building power for all people so that people can live freely and have equitable, fair, and inclusive lives. That's what the struggle is about today. It's about all power to the people.